Fine Health. This is Fred Littman coming to you from Nova Southeastern University. And as I always tell you, this is your show. And uh, we've had a number of inquiries over the last few months, again, about the issue of pain, pain management, uh, really a, a lot of it related to uh, some, uh, I would say, orthopedic uh, care, uh, replacement of knees, replacement of shoulders, replacement of hips. But uh, we're going to go a little bit beyond that because we're bringing someone back who was here about two years ago. And that's uh, W. Porter McRoberts, who is uh, an inter interventional pain expert. How about that? Expert is good. Welcome back, Mr. Roberts. I appreciate it. Welcome to be back. And uh, we have a gentleman that uh, is, uh, he has so many credentials behind his name, but I'm just going to say, you're a doctor of physical therapy with a number of fellowship training areas. And uh, that is Robert Blake. And he's uh, the rehabilitation supervisor at Holy Cross Orthopedic Institute. Welcome. Thank you very much. Good to, Good to have you. Thank what you. are all those titles behind your name? Your well, card is so big, it's like <laughs> two sizes long. Go ahead. Well, after any basic physical therapy education, every physical therapist has a choice whether they want to specialize in their field. So at our clinic over at Holy Cross, it's, it's kind of an understood thing that you must go above and beyond what you have from your basic education. Basic education is fine, but when you want to specialize in something like orthopedics or neurology, that option is there. So in my field in outpatient orthopedics, the first thing that I did was attain my manual therapy certification. So to do everything and get better with my hands. So I could perform joint mobilization, soft tissue mobilization, and understand really what I'm feeling beyond what I felt in my basic education from my uh, initial degree. And then after that, there's another option to do a fellowship. So you're actually working with other fellows in the field, fellows who have, been, who have had uh, multiple years of experience within the field of physical therapy, and they, they help you better understand research, how to research, how to interpret research, and how to implement that into everyday practice in order to get um, your patients better faster, to use an evidence-based approach to your rehabilitation. So all in all, it takes the manual therapy certification took about a year and a half, and then the fellowship on top of that took an additional two years. So it is a time commitment, but as, uh, as, as, we, as we practice at Holy Cross, and we've been practicing for a number of years, we realize that this extra certification that we've all achieved to various levels does definitely help us out when uh, dealing with patients and getting recovery better faster, understanding pain, understanding pathology, and of course being better with our hands and with the therapeutic exercises that we perform. Well, we're glad you were able to explain that to the folks out there because uh, as you all know, uh, we take great pride in our physical therapy program here, which is a doctoral program. But uh, we're very pleased to see that uh, you have. We always say, uh, being a health professional, you never stop learning. Absolutely. So we're glad to see all those acronyms right after your name. Thank you, Dr. McRoberts. Good to have you back. It's a pleasure. Uh, pain is such a constant question from our viewers, and uh, you really spoke out brilliantly when you were here last time, and I was hoping to get you back, and here you are. So uh, let's talk about uh, interventional pain management. So just a, a little background, interventional pain management is, is trying to ameliorate pain and interrupt the pain signal before it gets to the brain without using narcotics. So as you know, it's a huge, huge issue, especially in Florida, and luckily since uh, we've had some recent legislation that problem has become much, much more reasonable here in Florida and throughout the, the rest of the U.S. But our approach is to try and find a way, a weakness in the pain sensing system and then um, uh, use that to our advantage. For example, uh, just recently we were uh, part of a, a, a nationwide study on the use of a dorsal root ganglion stimulator, which doesn't sound like much to anybody if you don't understand what this little creature does. It is the, the brain of the sensory neuron for any part of your body. And it sits right in your spinal uh, foramen, right before the, the nerve comes into your spine. 
and it mitigates any painful stimulus and basically controls whether that pain should enter into the spinal cord and be transmitted up to your brain. So we did an FDA study, prospective study. We found 93% of patients were able to get at least 50% pain relief with this tiny little device, a little wire that goes over this dorsal root ganglion. And now we're able to inject this thing right into the, the, basically the brain of the pain sensing system and mitigate and change the actual experience and sensation of pain before it even gets into your spinal cord. But, but I, I'm going to interrupt you because I know you have a, you have a, you have a, uh, you have a lot of information, but let's explain to the folks sure. where, where this particular site is and how that you get to it. Um, they are very interested, by the way, in minimally invasive it is and I know invasive. it's minimal invasive, yes. so well, why don't we just quickly sure. explain it to you. Well, let's just back up just for a second. So when you cut yourself or you have any pain, what happens is there's one single nerve that goes from, say, your fingertip all the way up your arm, and then it goes to the DRG, then out the DRG, and it goes to your spinal cord. Then it's, it's rearranged, all that signal in the spinal cord and dissected. The feeling of pain is dissected. Then it's sent up your cord to the base of your brain, your thalamus, where that then, like a traffic cop, projects all of the pain signals out to different parts of your brain where you feel hurt, sorrow, anxiety, frustration, anger, and it colors the whole sensation with these emotions. So at any point in this distribution of what we call the pain sensing system, um, we, can, we can get involved. So the DRG, to be specific, is this little pea-sized nodule that sits right where the nerve enters the side of the spine. doesn't matter whether it's in your lumbar spine, thoracic spine, or in your neck. And it sits right there. And we, we bypassed this thing for years and years. We had no idea what it did. We just thought it was a minor little contributor. Lo and behold, it's really a filter. We call it a high-pass filter. So in people who have chronic pain, when we put a little recording electrode down, and listen to the DRG, it is, it's like a wild child in class speaking out of turn. And it is actually the cause of pain in most chronic painful states. So by pacing it, putting this little tiny electrode, this little wire, right over the DRG, we're able to pace it and bring it back down to normal, kind of, you know, put the kid in the corner who's been acting up in class, so to speak. So it's an electronic governor. Yes. So it's a tiny little sub-millimeter wire that is threaded through a little needle, passed over this little pea-sized brain, right. and then you just leave these four little electrodes right there, and uh, and then you have a small little pacemaker that you put underneath the skin and connect to this wire. Is, is it, pardon me, is it, is it implanted in the ganglion itself? Not yet, it just sits right on top, draped over it, right. actually. So you don't have to be inside the ganglion. It's so close that, uh, and the other thing that's interesting is that we really use that tiny fraction of the energy we used to use when we do spinal cord stimulation. So now we just use a primary cell. You don't need to recharge. It's a tiny little battery, and it just goes and goes and goes. Tiny little battery is implanted? Yes. Okay. That's great. It is. It's really great. It's one of those things where you Okay, you know, let's touch on something. Sure. Because last time when you were here, we were talking about the, uh, the, the terrible opioid uh, epidemic. Actually, we were talking about oxycodone. Yes. And the, 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 the horrible problems that were occurring, uh, not only uh, na nationally, but specifically, it, it, we were sort of the epicenter for the entire southeastern region. Uh, oh, well, I mean, uh, really. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, again, I, I'm glad to see that the, the legislative process reacted correctly. And uh, actually, the, the the state of Florida was one of the first entities governmentally to act upon that issue, and it has it has been replicated around the United States, particularly in the areas. You know, it's interesting how people uh, hear about. You know, uh, I, I, we never talk politics here, but you know, one's got to be blind not to see that you have a, a presidential race going on. But every one of the candidates on both sides were talking about uh, a drug use, primarily opioid use, heroin use, et cetera, et cetera, in almost every state that they, they came through. But a lot of that was, a lot of the work that was done to mitigate the overprescribing of opioid products was 
initiated by states, particularly the state of Florida. So I, I, I really applaud the reaction because it was, it was something that was needed by, by the medical community and obviously the folks who are here because they don't realize, I mean, opioid de dependency is something which, you know, you have no control over what has happened because the brain makes decisions. As, and you can add to it in, in, in just a minute, but uh, it, it, it's really a big difference from the time that you were here the last time. So let's talk a bit. Well, it's a huge difference, and this is one you know one of the times you really have to applaud government. I mean, thank God they stepped in at the right moment. Really, I think there's a ground uh, swell effort from physicians and others who presented this problem, and legislation was passed, uh, very appropriate legislation, which was done in concert with physicians guiding legislators. And this really cramped the style of people who were indiscriminately prescribing. And you know, this was a destination vacation spot for drug users for decades. It has been for even longer. You know, prior to that, it was cocaine. So this legislation took that power out of the hands of people who really didn't understand how to use opioids and placed it firmly in the hands of people who do. And opioids are still an important part of medicine. But the problem with opioids long term, as you suggest, is not only do they obscure your ability to think and make good decisions, etc., and also induce their own needs of addiction, but you become desensitized to their effect. So, say Percocet at 10 milligrams three times a day when you start it, works great. Three months later, it's not doing the job. Six months later, you need triple. And that is, it's a phenomenon. It has nothing to do with our constitution or who we are. It's just the way human beings and all animals are made. We're, it's a toxin. It's, it's a hormone that with too much of it is a toxin. So we mitigate that, our own bodies do, by suppressing its effects. So we need more and more and more. And there's no way around it. So opioids, while they work great for acute pain, they're just not the answer in chronic pain at all. Well, I'm glad we, we got to it. Because it was a conversation that, that took up a, a good portion of our last broadcast when you were here. We didn't mean to have you just sit there on the side. I took the opportunity to talk to Dr. McRollins because it was a major portion of of uh, the conversation, even though we were trying to get to, you know, his skill as an interventional uh, pain management person with his knowledge and capabilities, just as he was starting out to talk about uh, this, the, the new method of control. But, you know, you end up with the patient ex post facto of the involvement with the physicians beforehand, the physicians who are surgically involved, the physicians who are referring you based upon certain inabilities of individuals, and now they play them into the, into the wonderful hands of you, your staff, and your institute. So let's talk a bit about it. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. The opioid addiction has been a problem for many years, and us, as physical therapists, we feel that we can be at the forefront of that to try to tackle people's addictions to opioids. A lot of the patients that come into our clinic have these types of, uh, we wouldn't say opioid addictions because they would never admit to that, but they've been on them for a number of years to try to combat their pain. They go to somebody like Dr. Rick Robertson and he does his, uh, his portion in order to try to decrease their pain, and successfully so in a lot of the times. But then he realizes that the patient needs a little bit more than that in order to fully take control of their situation. So as a physical therapist, when they come in, we want the patient to have full control of their situation. So know that if the pain does come back to, uh, to maybe to a lesser extent or even to the way it was before, they have to know how to manage that type of pain themselves. So a lot of, a lot of the, the things that we do has to do with education of the patient as to why the pain process is happening. We look at them from a functional standpoint, and then we see if they've, if they've adapted any type of functional movements that aren't necessarily good for them. Say, for example, if a person comes in with years of chronic low back pain, and they walk in and they're afraid to bend, they're afraid to move, they're afraid to, to, to sit, go from a sitting to a standing position with, uh, with, with confidence, things like that. Even though you look at the MRI of the back and it doesn't say that they have anything that's crucially wrong with them that would require surgery, they're moving around as such. So we tell them that the more you move, especially the, inter the segments of their spine, the better the lubrication or blood flow or circulation that's going to go through there and that's going to promote healing. On top of that, with the manual therapy certification, I would use my hands to assess each individual joint. 
the spine or remain a patient. Sometimes that joint needs a little bit of assistance to move. If it needs a little bit of assistance to move, I'll take my hands and I'll gently move it and then give it that assistance it needs. But on top of that, instead of just letting them walk out the door, because at that point they're probably going to feel better, the exercise component is very important as well. Because that, that, that muscle has been in such a solid, rigid, spastic state for such a long period of time, it wants to go back to that protective state. So the motion, the specific exercises that we do in order to combat that patient's specific pathology or problem is going to be very important too. So it's all about the assessment, the functional assessment, the, the, the segmental assessment with the joint, and then following it up with good manual therapy and then good exercises for them to do not only in the clinic, but at home as well. And if they really want to decrease their chronic pain that they're having, they're going to have to continue on with their home exercise program or gym program for the rest of their lives. And that's how you manage your own pain. If it does happen to come up, again, then we would realize that the patient has to know what to do aside from going to the, to the medicine cabinet in order to decrease that pain and bring it back to where it was before. So there's a little bit of a psychological factor too with the chronic pain patients because they've been in pain for so long, we have to take them away from that and let them know that they are okay, that it is okay to move, you just have to do it responsibly. You know, it's interesting to know that I hear, I'm sure you realize that uh, the mother school of our health professional division is the School of Osteopathic Medicine. Yes. It's, it's, it, it, I think I discussed this with you when we were on the show, is that, you know, uh, at my alma mater, Columbia University in New York, uh, the, the College of Medicine now has a, a, a particular required course. It's called non-surgical orthopedics. Now, non-surgical orthopedics is osteopathic manipulation, which is what you're, in essence, what you're talking about. Because one of the things that really is very interesting to me, and I... Unfortunately, I, I came to meet a friend of mine uh, recently at an airport uh, that I had not seen for maybe 10 years and came out in a wheelchair, then got into, you know, grabbed his cane, started, I said, what happened? And he said, oh, it's the same thing, it's been like this for 10, 15 years. And I said, but you know, I said, where are you, who's caring for you? What's going on? Do you, do you exercise? Do you stretch? Do you do this? And I'm not playing doctor. I'm just asking questions. But he was in a true state of devolution. You know, he was evolving. He was, that was it, non-movement, becoming statuesque. Couldn't move an arm, couldn't do this, couldn't do that. And I guess that's what you're talking about. In other words, the, it's not just... The, the rehabilitation of a portion of the body that has been surgerized or uh, aided by pain reduction, it's this that has to be told because you can prove to them that they can be much better off if they do what we would call traditional human instinctive movement. Yes, absolutely, and that's, that's what we strive to do every day. And, and some, some patients will take offense if you say it in, in a way that it's, it's psychological. So they'll say something like, well, it's all in my head. But no, it's not really all in your head. It's just like uh, Dr. McRoberts was saying, it's that feedback from the, from the area of pain to your brain and then going back. And then the brain says, well, what can I do and what can't I do? So if the patient, for example, uh, picked up a pen off the floor, and then that's when their back started to hurt. In the future, they might not want to bend or pick up a pen off the floor anymore. And then, like you mentioned, then the patient just stops functioning. They stop moving, they become statuesque. And then when that happens, the circulation decreases, and then you have to look at the whole body as a whole. You can't just look at the back. You have to look at how everything else, how the walking, because the walking includes everything in the entire body. But walking is so important to so low back function. When you move and you and you you actually take every step, you're actually getting that compression, that mild compression through the spine, back and forth, back and forth, and that's actually what gives your intervertebral discs their nutrition. If you're not walking as much and you're just stagnant and you're just sitting in a recliner all day, your pathology or your problem is just going to get worse. Even though you think it might be getting better because you're sitting there and it doesn't hurt when you don't move, when you do have to move or you go to move, then actually less efficient at doing it, and then more systems start to break down. So we 
trying to tell patients this, how you try to explain the pain process of it, the chronic pain process of it, in order for them to feel more comfortable to make the motions that they have to make in order to, for them to return to the function. Because when patients aren't functioning properly and, it's a, and they're living a debilitating lifestyle, then that's when all the depression starts to set in. There's been a high prevalence or correlation between patients with chronic low back pain and depression. Not sure which one comes first, or if, the, if somebody has underlying depression before, then they all of a sudden hurt their back if that makes it worse. But there has been that strong correlation. And it probably has something to do with the, their, their life is just so interrupted. They don't know what to do with themselves. Before, they're this active individual, and now they're, they're relegated to, to sitting in a chair. They can't run, they can't move, they can't walk. So when the patients come in, the last thing that I want to tell them is, you will not be able to do this again. You cannot do this again. You cannot bend over and do and perform this motion again. I want them, I want them to know that my goal is the same thing as their goal, to get you back to the function that you desire. Because when I do that, and they actually see that they can perform these motions, then their overall quality of life picks up. It, it gets better. Everybody around them feels better about their progress. They have better family lives. They have better friendships, relationships. The stories that I hear with people with chronic pain, how they used to go out and so forth with their friends, now they, they, they don't do that anymore. They just sit down because they're afraid to move. They're afraid if they go out to a restaurant and sit for an extended period of time, they're not going to be able to get out of the chair and then there's just going to be days of pain. But patients like that have to realize that there is a way out. And the first step in that is coming to a, a competent physical therapist in order for them to help you move again, help you regain your lifestyle back again, because ultimately that's the most important thing. Like I mentioned, for the patients to take control back over their life, and if they do have some kind of exacerbation of pain, we have to have them have strategies, or they have to know strategies on how to deal with that in order to uh, to continue on without having this stressful, over-anxious response to what it is that they're feeling. So self-control, I think, is what patients need the most. And the communication between the therapist and the patient, I think, is paramount between any relationship. You hit it right on the nose, right smack on the nose. Dr. McLovitz, I, I remember I was thinking back as I was listening. I was thinking back to the previous show that we did, and I, I think I posed the question uh, to the fact that, you know, you, as an interventional pain management person, a qualified physician who's well beyond that, uh, I said, you know, I, you hear all the time, and I hear from the viewers about this. Uh, well, what I did was I went in and I got an epidural. You know, and I did this, and I did it and three times, four times, until finally, you know, I, again, I'm not playing doctor, but I know very, very clearly you load up on all these corticosteroids, you know what happens. And you responded, and I want you to, let's talk about that again. So they all have their place. And, you know, the way I look at our job as interventionalists is my job is to reduce the pain to a degree that uh, Dr. Blake can work his magic. And, you know, I, I see chronic pain as is not just a, a disturbing situation it's an issue of mortality. We know there's a Honolulu men's walking study, for example, that looked at retired men who could walk more than two miles versus less than one mile. The difference in longevity was seven years difference in those two groups of people. So if you could walk more than two miles versus less than one, you added seven years to your life. Not just you can go out with your friends, which is very important, Robert's right, but if, if we can't get these, these folks walking and active again, they will die sooner. And we think about, you know, we'll spend a hundred, three hundred thousand dollars for an additional, you know, one to three months of life with an oncology drug. You know, money well spent with this gentleman right here, you can get years and years back and not just some years, quality years. So the, what's the point of an epidural? The point of an epidural is really to get him comfortable enough to return to Robert's hands, in my opinion. Or say, for example, facet joint nerve block or an ablation. Again, is to get the pain down to a degree so that they're not as afraid to do the activities, and that's the key to it, the activities that they were formerly able to do. I really think we should be measuring our success not with the visual analog scale. It should be with an accelerometer on a wrist and see how active we are. And that really should be the ultimate measure of our success or failure. Because if we don't return people to walking and standing and, and shopping, because quite honestly, as we age, you don't have to run marathons to be healthy. You just have to be able to shop and pick up your grandkids. And if you're not able to do 
those things, your, your, not only your quality of life, but your risk of morbidity and mortality, things like cancer, stroke, osteoporosis, Alzheimer's degree, disease, cardiovascular disease, peripheral and central, these are all linked to activity. And you can go on and on. What are the greatest killers in America? We've just named them. They're all related to physical activity. My job is to reduce the pain through these interventions, not load people up on steroids ad infinitum, get them into Robert Kane so we can do the rest. And the other thing is, uh, I, I, and I know we're getting down to the last few minutes of the show, but I want to get this in. I, it, it sort of bothers me every once in a while when I listen to these pharmaceutical products that are, that are advertised on television. And now I see a lot of talk about, uh, you know, opioid constipation, and now you take this particular drug, but, you know, I'm saying to myself, there must be a huge, huge number of people that are out there that are victims, and this is what, what is happening, and what I hear from both of you is that if we can prevent, all right, that from occurring, we're going to increase the opportunities. But the folks out here only want to have a quality of life. Of course. That's what they want. We Absolutely. discussed that when you were here last time. That's why they're interested. Yep. That's why they're so interested in minimally invasive surgical sure. techniques. They don't like cutting. They don't like pain. Yep. They certainly don't like pain. And uh, and you hit it on the head. Uh, I, I just want to, like I said, that we have a we're short on time here. But I, I want to just tell you that uh, I am totally enamored and I respectful of the kind of work that both of you do. And I really think that you both hit on a very important thing. The folks out there that ask us to bring people in are really looking for an opportunity to have a quality of life because they've earned it. These are the survivors. In they sense. are. They have this, we have the highest percentage of people over 70 of any state in the union, over 80 definitely, and here we are, and you know, and they want to have some quality of life. You nailed it, you nailed it. But I want you to finish up because we're down to the last minute of this show. So it's yours. Thank you. I would say, speaking for both of us, if you're sitting, you should be standing. <laughs> and if you're standing, you should be walking. And if you're walking, you should be running. If you're not moving, if you're not happy with what you're doing, you need to see us. It is incumbent upon you. That's what you got to put the ball in motion. It is not okay to be pushing your walker around because you have spinal stenosis when we have a minimally invasive spacer that can cure your problem in 20 minutes. They have to make the initial move to come see me, to come see Dr. Blake, and get going. There are answers for even the most esoteric issues. We still have answers for people who can't use their hands because they've had a laceration of a nerve or chronic pain from an amputation. We can use products, devices, tiny amounts of drugs put in just the right spot to reduce pain. Robert, on the other hand, I have a sacroiliac joint problem. I'm non-functional without this guy's hands. He puts it in the right spot. I do the homework he gives me. I'm okay. I haven't seen him in about four or five months now. But it's incumbent upon not only to get to us, but then also to do the thing. It's kind of like going to the dentist, get your tooth cleaned, and then not doing your, your, your brush. Having Robert's instruction going forward, it's incumbent on patients to get to us and then follow our direction. Our aim is the same as theirs, simply to get them moving, get them doing and engaged back into their life. And if they're not, it's, it, the consequences are far greater than they will ever know. They'll I'm die sooner than that. I'm going to have to interrupt you. I apologize. I say, you know, the, the clock on the wall says we're, we're, we're finished. Right. So I want to thank you both, not only for your being here, but more importantly, for your knowledge and your capabilities. Because those folks that are viewing us need that. They need that. They want that quality of life. And I appreciate both of you with your knowledge, with your intent, and with your medical and your humane souls. Because that's what, that's what I hear. I hear the opportunity not to ask patients to come in to have surgical you know, implants or to have this or have that. Which is nothing wrong with that. Sure. But what both of you are saying.